This is the 24th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses why CPUs need clocks and how we incorporate clocks into latches. The previous video shows how to build an SR latch, a device that can store one bit of data. Now let's use these latches to make some circuits. But before I do that, I need to explain this notation. Drawing a logic gate on a bus is a shortcut for this, placing a gate on each corresponding pair of wires. Combining these parallel gates into a single symbol makes the diagram much easier to understand. Let's apply the same notation to the latches. As we saw in the last video, the feedback loop in this D-latch can store one bit. However, we can connect it to a four-bit bus when we want to store four bits. This notation represents four D-latches working in parallel, each storing one bit. If we showed each latch separately, it would look like this. Okay, so now let's take this four-bit D-latch and put it to use. This circuit is intended to perform repeated addition. So for this example, we're going to set the pin named input to five. The idea is that the output of the adder is stored in the set of D-latches and then fed back into the adder which adds 5 again. And we can let this process repeat to add 5 to itself as many times as we'd like. Notice when I move the simulation one time step forward, the output of the D-latch is all 1's. This is because JLS initializes the output of not NAND and NOR gates to 1. We don't want this startup value to affect our computation. By that I mean we don't want 65535 included in our sum. So I initially set the pass input pin to 0, hold it there for a time of 10, and then set it to 1. By initially setting the pass input pin to 0, this AND gate will initially block that junk value coming out of the D-latch. Notice that by time 5, the D-latch has settled down and set itself to a reasonable initial state of 0. And then at time 10, when the pass input value gets set to 1, the AND gate will then pass through the output of the latch back into the adder. The ripple carry adder has a propagation delay of 345. If I set up the simulator to step forward 50 units of time, then I expect to see the output of the D latch count up 5 every few steps. So after one step, or 50 units forward, the D-latch has a 5 like we'd kind of expect. But that second 50 steps takes us all the way up to 15. And then 0, and then 25. So this is a little bit odd. Maybe our step isn't quite right. Maybe it needs to be synced up with the adder. There's something that we need to watch here. But if we keep going, we eventually get 6. And then 5, and then 35 and then 39. So obviously something's wrong here since we're getting outputs that aren't even multiples of 5. So what's going on? Pause the video and see if you can figure out what's broken about this setup. And to be clear, the problem is with the way we're using the latch. The adder itself is fine. So part of the problem is the transient values from the adder. Remember back in video 12, where we saw how circuits can generate several wrong answers before settling on the correct answer? Now this can happen both with respect to an individual bit as it transitions from 1 down to 0, and it can also happen at a larger level, like where an adder will produce several different answers before settling on the final correct answer. Okay, so let's go back to the adder, and this time we'll step in units of 10. So if I step forward to time 40, Notice that the adder is correctly set up to be adding 5 and 5 like we expect. However, at time 60, the adder is producing a transient output of 0. And then at time 70, this transient value of 0 is being sent back into the adder. In other words, the adder's input is changing before it's done using it. It's this changing of inputs while the addition is still in progress that messes up the calculations. Because the latch is the data source for the adder, we need a mechanism of preventing it from taking on a new value until we're done using the old value. This need for gatekeeping is why most CPUs have clocks. A clock is just a device that produces a signal that periodically switches between 0 and 1. We can use this predictable change to control when a latch is allowed to take on a new value, 
thus guaranteeing that the latch's output remains unchanged. As a first attempt, let's use the clock as a kind of traffic light and allow the D-latch to take on a new value only when the clock is 1. Pause the video and figure out how to use logic gates to tie the clock into this D-latch in such a way that it only changes when the clock is 1. Here's a hint. Remember that there is an SR latch inside of this D-latch. To see how to do this, think back to the SR latch. How do we tell the SR latch to hold on to its current value? We do that by putting zeros on both the R and S inputs. So what logic gate is going to assure a zero output whenever the clock is zero? Well, an AND gate, because A and false is always false. So whenever the clock is zero, the inner SR latch will have zero inputs on both R and S, and therefore will hold the current value. And then because A and true is always true, when the clock is one, the AND gates will simply pass along the data signal and behave as we discussed last week. So let's add a clock to our repeated addition loop and see what happens. Again, the adder's time is 335. So I'll set the clock to be on for 500 and off for 500 to make sure that the adder has more than enough time to complete the addition between clock cycles. I'll also set the step to 50. So at first, everything looks good. The D latches hold that initial 65535 value for the entire 500 units that the clock is at zero. And then when we step to 550, we see that the clock switches to one and the result of the addition is allowed into the latch. It now has a state of five. But then things start to go wrong again. We have a zero and a 15 and a 10, and now we're back to where we don't even have multiples of five anymore. So something's still wrong. Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. It's actually just the same problem as before. When the clock was at zero, the D latches hold their value as expected. However, as soon as the clock turns to one, the circuit behaves just like the original circuit. The adder receives and responds to transient values, resulting in the garbage values we see in the latches. Think of it this way. The clock is supposed to act as a door. And while it is acting as a door, we're leaving the door open half the time. So we've got problems here, just like you'd have problems at home if your door was left open 12 hours a day and only closed the other 12. What we need is a figurative door that's open just long enough to let the new value in. Just like at home, you open the door just long enough to walk in and then you close it behind you to keep the heat in and the mice out. We'll see how to build such a door in the next video. For now, make sure you can explain why CPUs need clocks. At minimum, you should be able to walk through an example of what goes wrong when a circuit that needs a clock doesn't have one. You should also be able to sketch a clocked SR latch and a clocked D latch and explain how these latches work. In the next video, we'll see how to use clock latches to build something called a flip-flop, which is this figurative door I've been talking about.